Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Welcome back to another episode of the Robbie Basil Show. Sorry if my hair looks a mess, and quite frankly, the schedule for this channel uh, recently has been a, a little bit of a mess. Uh, my uh, The schedule for me recording has been a little bit off. I've been very busy with uh, certain things going on, and quite frankly, I'm sorry that I didn't really say anything about no video on Tuesday. However, however, however... We didn't miss anything that crazy. What's the schedule going forward? Before I go into the craziness, we have the Olympics to partially talk about. We're only going to go into sports that I know a lot about. So we're going to talk about Olympic tennis. We got rugby, which is like, I'm, I've always been a fan of rugby. So we'll go into that. Uh, we got tennis. We got rugby. Next week, we got track and field and swimming. So we have to talk about all that next week. Uh, but today, we got soccer. Yeah, men's soccer, you got rugby, tennis, and golf. I think that's about it. Um, on the Olympic side. Then we also have F1 and the craziness of Hungary to the possible craziness of Belgium. Uh, we're going to talk a little, about, a little bit of baseball. And that's actually what we're starting with today's video. Is, a, is your MLB season update? Uh, we don't have a sponsor, so we're just going to quickly go through this. Also, shout out to my boys who I was watching the Met game with last night. The Mets game was crazy, but we're not going into the Mets yet. But we're starting with the New York Yankees and the American League East. So, the American League East, this is the best you're going to get on this, has been very interesting. It's headlined by Baltimore, who are taking this trade deadline very interestingly so far. They acquired Zach Eflin uh, just moments before the start of this recording. I have a feeling they might be doing more, maybe addressing the bullpen. I'm probably forgetting a move that they've done, but I think that's a decent start. I think they're going to need to do more. I think Zach Eflin's a good piece, but if they want to really contend for a World Series, they're going to need to do a little bit better than Zach Eflin, but they do have Corbin Burns, so take it with a grain of salt. Uh, in second place is the Yankees, who've been really sliding. I mean, heck, they're one of the best teams in baseball, and as of late, they've looked like one of the worst. However, don't let the record fool you. They're still, they still have 60 wins. You could take it multiple ways. And the way I'm going to take it is, how do they approach the trade deadline? They have the possibility to win a World Series still. I think they still, ha still have that possibility. But Cashman's aggressiveness is going to determine this entire season. Aaron Judge is a menace to society. He hits everything that's thrown at him. He rakes. You have Juan Soto, who rakes. And what else? I'm trying to see if like anything comes out of my closet to try to see who it's behind door number three, because no one's no, really behind door number three. The problem is that they have really have nothing behind them. And yeah, they got some other pieces, but... Are they really gonna be the par the parts of the pieces of the puzzle that takes you to a World Series? I don't think so. I think they need to be more aggressive at the deadline. Could they acquire more pitching? Of course they can. You can never have enough pitching. But I think Yankees fans will be happy if the deadline's better than just acquiring Kenya Middleton and Spencer Howard. So, uh, baby steps. But hopefully they go out and be aggressive. Boston's here. They're in third. I projected them to finish in last, and, they fin and they're currently in third, because that's just how this works. Uh, Bo uh, Boston has taken, I think, should take an interesting approach to this, and that is be aggressive, because we don't know how they're going to continue long term. Yeah, they got Dever, yeah, they have led by Rafael Devers, they have a f future centerpiece in Jaron Duran, who's having a all-star, he ha was an all-star this year at center field. They need to address pitching. Anything is better than what they have. They have Bale, they have a couple other pieces. They have Tanner Houck as well, who I almost forgot to mention. But they just need something else to get them over that edge. And I just don't think right now that they, ha they have that. I mean, heck, there's a lot of sellers. I, I think maybe give a call to some teams. Maybe trying to go out there and get a franchise centerpiece at starting pitching. I don't know. It's a possibility. I just want to see how aggressive they can be. But they're in a good spot. I think they have a good chance of making it into the wild card. In fourth is Tampa, who just traded Randy Rose Arena. So they're probably going to stay in fourth. At best, they are one game over 500. they They're a weird team. Because they just traded Randy Rose Arena 
when the last year they could have traded Randy or Rosarena and got a lot more. Now, I am, I'll just say this. I am not totally against the trade of Randy or Rosarena from, from the Rays' perspective. Because the minor leaguers they got, yes, they're in high A or whatever. But they've been good in high A, and they're both young. So I think it kind of works. But at least they've been a better situation than what Toronto is in. They're bottom. They've been bad. They're, they should be trading Vlad. I mean, heck, injuries and underperformance have really caused them to slide like the way that they have. Jose Barrios, who was the, the, the big pitching signing from a couple years ago, has done absolutely nothing other than piss off the team and his fantasy owners and has led to the part, has been part of this team's demise. The whole team has been failing. The bullpen is the equivalent of a garbage can. And that's about it for how I'm going to say on Toronto. They've been bad. That's all you need to know. In the American League Central, Cleveland still leads, despite not having Shane Bieber, because that makes sense. This is Major League Baseball, and nothing makes any goddamn sense anymore. Uh, bottom are the White Sox, who are the worst team I've ever seen, other than the Oakland Athletics from very recent. You know you're bad when you have 10 road wins all season. It's late July. How are you doing? They're not in a good spot. Uh, who are they going to trade? I don't even know. I mean, they might have to trade Robert. Or are they going to trade somebody else? I don't know. I don't get it. I don't get what they're trying to do. To sell more pieces, you'll hopefully maybe get the first pick. They might bottle the first pick. Who knows? But the White Sox suck. The revival of the Twins. Now, the Twins have been battered with injuries. Injuries and underperformance have led them to being in second, but they've been on the rise as of late, and I think they're really making a move towards winning this division. But I said there was going to be a surprise team in this division. I picked the wrong one. I was thinking it could be the Royals, but I picked the Tigers, and it turns out option A was better than option B, and the Royals are still here. Why? I don't know. I don't, I don't know why. Other than that, their home record is 35 and 20 at Kauffman Stadium, whatever they called it. I think it's still Kauffman Stadium, right? I don't know. The, the Royals are still here. They'll be in the conversation. Cole Reagans is amazing, apparently. I don't really think a Royals pitcher would be good, but here they are. A team that recently has been known for bottling the Whit Merrifield trade and just failing to get good value on players has actually started to develop a young core that might have a chance of doing something in the next couple of years because the AL Central is completely terrible for the most part. However, Bobby Witt will be leading this team to glory in like two years. Uh, they're not ready for the big time yet unless they make like some stupid trades that like maybe will help them get to the wild card. I just don't see it, but that's just me. But the Royals have been making some noise. The Tigers could, I mean, I see them maybe making the wild card. But I don't know what they're going to do. I think they could, st they might sell, but honestly, who knows? Who knows with them at this point? 81 and 81 would be on the cards for them at this point. Uh, to the AL West, leading the charge is, unfortunately, the Red Hot Houston, Houston Astros. Now, while this re this uh, last 10 game stretch has been pretty meh, they have overtaken the division lead. In second place, is the struggling Seattle Mariners who can't hit a baseball with an with a with a freaking four was it a two by four or like a giant oh well you get you they cannot hit a baseball with a freaking thirty long pole because their batting average is terrible the pitching is there they have a lot of great arms but little did we know that their offense would would once again lead to their demise to address this problem because they have power, no batting average, they went for a guy who is all power and no batting average, because that is exactly how the Mariners have it going to address this deadline, because that's just who they are. They also traded for Yimmy Garcia for the bullpen, I actually think that could kind of work, but the Mariners, they need some contact, they need more batting average, not more power, because Randy Arozarena is hitting like 210. They're not going to get a lot out of that in terms of batting average. Who do I... I mean, heck, I, they try and trade for... I mean, Arias was already traded, so I was just about to say trade for Luis Arias, but he got traded already. So, 
I don't know where the Mariners go from here. But at least they're not Oakland That's at the end of the day. But we'll talk about them in a minute. They're, the Mariners have a lot of work to do still. Another team that has a lot of work to do still is the Rangers, who are shockingly have the same record, I believe, as older, a game ahead, half game ahead of the Tigers, which is, one, sad, and two, question mark. It just, this team is a question mark. They have a lot of good players, but I believe they've had some injury problems as well. I just don't remember to who. They've had a lot of hope, but this division has turned out to be way better than I thought it would be if we were in Bizarro World, because the records in this division are completely horrible. Who would have thought that the AL Central would have better records than the West? I don't know. I, you would have had to tell me I'm a crazy person to think that, but here we are. I'll move a little bit more now in the National League East. The Red Hot New York Mets are still not in second because I, they don't like themselves, apparently. I don't know. Uh, leading the charge is the Marlins for the base for the spot in the basement. Uh, they are 37 and 66. They're going to be sellers as per usual. Jazz Chisholm's days are, are Jazz Chisholm's days are numbered in Miami. Who knows where he goes? Future Los Angeles Dodger Pete Alonso leads the charge for the Mets and might be joining possibly future Los Angeles Dodger uh, Jazz Chisholm. Now I'm joking about the future Dodger part, but they just seem like future Dodgers players to me. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Uh, the Nationals. Now, I didn't have a lot of hope for the Nationals. They've actually been kind of competent, way more competent than I thought they were going to be. Uh, they have some future star players. They just need to continue building something from whatever they have right now, and they're going to be fine in like three years, but not yet for them. They need a lot of pitching help, and I just don't see them really doing anything at the deadline. I think they should stay put and just continue to build with the young core. Atlanta is in second. They've been sliding since the injury to Ronald Acuna. Their road record is horrendous. They lost to the Mets last night. That outfield does not look good. I think they might have to address that at the deadline. Who do they go for? No clue. But they, I think that is going to be a need for them. Because that always feels like a need for them at this point. They have had a lot of injuries. A lot of problems in other spots. But they have been really underperforming. Matt Olson. Hasn't been great, but Austin Riley and company need to figure it out because Philadelphia is running away with it. They have been led by a swarm of starting pitching stars. You have Nola. You have Zach Wheeler. They've both been great. Now sprinkle in a little bit of Ranger Suarez or Chris, I think it was his name, Christopher Sanchez or whoever the hell it is, that lefty guy. I think that's his name. Is it his name? Who knows? But you get where I'm going with this. I uh, ignore Taiwan Walker. Like, don't pay attention to that part. He's been bad. But the rest of the team has been pretty good. Bryce Harper, Rakes, Alec Boehm is good. Has been fine. They've hit everything, and they've been awesome. It's 37 and 16, one of the best home records, if not if not the best home record in baseball. They've been awesome, and the city of brotherly love has been actually way more fun to watch than I thought they would be which is, is, as a Mets fan, very concerning. But fun, as the main baseball fan of me, is like, yeah, they've been pretty fun. But this division, is, I think, is going to be a fight to the end. I think the Mets, the way they've risen, heck, I think they're going to be they're gonna be a play, possibly a playoff team. But we've heard today that I think I do believe, from like what the sources have been saying, that the Mets are going to be players at the deadline, which, as a Mets fan... They, you've heard that in the past, and the big piece you traded for is Miguel Castro. So, we don't know how it's going to go at this point. What we do know is that the Giants are selling, and I don't know who they're going to trade. Uh, Michael Conforto has been rumored in trades a lot, which future probably... I, I think he would be a fun piece for the Braves. Now, while the Intermet fan of me would be very sad that I have to root against Michael Conforto, because I still like Michael Conforto, I think he'd be a p perfect piece for the Braves because the Giants suck and they are sellers. Uh, the San Diego Potters are back. They've been led by a plethora of players. The Dodgers are the Dodgers and the Diamondbacks made a trade yesterday. I don't really remember for who, but they made a trade, which puzzled me. I don't even remember what the trade was. Uh, we'll go into more all the trades in a minute. And then you have the Rockies. Less said about them, the better. Speaking of sellers, the Cubs... What a horrible team they are. 
you know, I had a lot of faith for them. I projected them to win the division. But apparently, whoever I project to win the Central, whoever I pick every year to win the Central, just sucks and sells at the deadline. Last year it was the Cardinals. This year it's the Cubs. And the Cubs are bottom. And they're going to be selling because their bullpen is the equivalent of a... I mean, it's the equivalent of a, another team's bullpen's equivalent of a garbage can. It's bad. The Reds... They've had a really down year. I'm a little bit disappointed in Cincinnati. I thought they were going to be way better than this. Pittsburgh's revival has been led by the emergence of Paul Skeens. He's going to... I think he's going to... He's like Spencer Strider to me. Remember when Spencer Strider came up and he was really good? But then he's like started to taper off a little bit after like two years. Possibly due to the injury he had this year. And we don't know how he's going to look like in the future. But bear with me here. I think this year is going to be like a really big year for Skeens. He'll be in the Cy Young race. But I think as we go on, there's a good chance that he fades away. That's just from my view of it. Because I don't know if the way he's pitching is sustainable. Like the low ERA, the high strikeout numbers. Because major league hitters can adjust really well, I think. And I don't know. I think they'll pick up on him eventually. The Cardinals are here. I don't know how. And the no offense Brewers are in first. They're probably laughing at Craig Council like right now when since the Brewers are in first and Cubs are last. Honestly, I don't know what any team at this in this division does at the deadline. We'll, re we'll recap the deadline on Tuesday uh, because we'll hopefully record the video after the deadline happens. So this division, Major League Baseball, has been fun. But you know what else is fun? The Summer Olympics. We are talking... Summer Olympics, and we're going to begin with the sport I'll be talking about the least because it, it, it's almost done already. That is Olympic rugby. So rugby, uh, if you want to skip like three minutes to go to the next sport, I would do that if I were you. But rugby sevens, if any, if you guys don't know how this works, it is a basically seven on seven rugby. It's 12, te 12 teams three pools and you have to finish top two to automatically qualify and if you finish in third you might make it to the knockouts here are uh the teams we'll go over men's and women's rugby even though i'll be more in depth with the men's side um here's the tournaments um we have france new zealand argentina fiji australia uruguay ireland the united states kenya samoa japan south africa this pool is of teams was stupid it is so quality here are the women's teams by the way france united states australia new zealand ireland brazil great britain england south africa fiji japan and china so now here we are here are the pools uh like i said you have to finish top two and if you finish in third you have a chance of making the next round unless you just suck and you just don't make it i don't know i don't know how to put it um also Point scoring. Before we go look at the group stage, uh, you get three points for a win, two points for a draw, and one point for a loss. It's not zero for this. So if you see three points but a team doesn't win, you'll know why. Uh, group A uh, was led by New Zealand leading the charge. Um, Ireland finished in second after doing the equivalent of nothing. Uh, South Africa's here. Very disappointing from them. They're usually... One of the top dogs. They've won a Rugby World Cups. They've done a lot. Japan bottom. They were the worst team in the group. 129 points allowed in Rugby 7s is actually really bad. But when you have three powerhouse nations in your group, I don't know what else to tell you. Those three are like could have a chance of being top five in the world. But they're all really good and they all made the knockouts. Group B was by far the worst group. Australia, Argentina, Samoa, and Kenya. Really disappointed in Samoa and Kenya because years ago they were really good. Unfortunately, Australia is so good, and Argentina is like up and it's like been around for a while in this. If I had to make a prediction before the tournament, I thought it would be Samoa, but thank God I didn't make that prediction because um, Argentina beat Samoa. But Argentina is here; they've made the knockouts. Congratulations, Australia. Also winning the group, I mean, the points for number is a little low compared to New Zealand. It's barely more than second place Ireland. They've had less than first place Argentina, but 
You'll see why it's not a problem in a minute. And then Group C, led by Fiji. Now, United States fans were concerned when the United States lost to Fiji on match day one. They then beat Uruguay and drew France. So, fair enough. Uh, Fiji have been flying. They looked so good. That Fijian team looked really good in the group stage. They didn't really break a sweat. And they went out and destroyed everyone on the playing field. Which set up this knockout group with New Zealand and South Africa. Which is like the greatest matchup that you could possibly have. That should have been a final. in the, But it was in the quarterfinals. South Africa and New Zealand. The game was actually pretty bad. Um, not a lot of action. But South Africa did come up on tops uh, 14-7. In front of the home crowd, defeated Argentina, which is a very interesting result. France now having to play South Africa t- tomorrow. Have fun. Uh, we had Fiji defeat Ireland in a battle of two uh, giants of the game. Ireland fa- fairly solid in their own right. They almost won the Rugby World Cup, the bigger Rugby World Cup, not sevens, the main Rugby World Cup. They are top five in the world. And then Australia. They destroyed the United States to set up this semifinal. Fiji, Australia in the Battle of Oceania, and South Africa and France. If I had to pick a winner, I would say it was going to be Fiji or South Africa. I think the Fijians have been flying. They beat a really good team in the Irish. It's going to depend on how South Africa plays France. Because if France wins, whoever wins the bottom game is beating France. I mean, heck, whoever wins that bottom match is winning the whole thing. I think Fiji, for how good they've looked against some decent teams, I think it's going to be Fiji, but I could be terribly wrong. That's just how it is sometimes. Uh, The women's side, I don't know about women's rugby very much, but we'll go over it briefly anyway. Um, Those are the teams. We already went over this. Group A, um, we'll go to Group A, was led by, oh, right, this hasn't started yet. I'm stupid. Um. But we'll go over the groups now. New Zealand, Fiji, Canada, and China. New, the top three are all great in their own right. China's not very good. Uh, New Zealand and Fiji would have players, if you paid attention to rugby, that you would actually know about. Canada's okay. They've always bit, been in the rugby mix for both men's and women's, but that's that group. Group B are Australia, Ireland, Great Britain, South Africa. That group's loaded. Watch out for Australia, and I think Great Britain and South Africa are good. This group's very balanced, and that's what you want. All four teams, I think, have a good chance of winning the group. And then Group C, France, is playing the United States and something else. We'll talk about what why I'm saying that in a minute. But Japan, Brazil, I think that, once again, I think it should be the top two how it is. Japan and Brazil, I like. The Japanese have been developing rugby on both sides very well. But I think Brazil is probably going to be a team that's more physical. So we'll see how that goes. But rugby has has been all right so far. I mean, the men. I thought the women's side started already, but it actually hasn't. Starts I think in two days. That's how you know I haven't really been paying attention to the Olympics that much. But I will tell you something I haven't paid. I've been paying attention to that, my friends, is football. We are going to men's soccer next. Welcome to Olympic men's soccer. Sixteen teams. We've talked about the groups before. We'll go over it again. We haven't actually, we didn't get to predict the whole thing, which sucked. Here's how you qualify. Uh, there's like a, it's all under 23s, and pretty much, and you can call up like three over 23 players, which is why France is going to win this thing. But besides the point, uh, and those are the venues. It's actually really cool. There's been a lot of controversy controversies, and we'll explain why in a minute. We saw the teams. We saw the draws. Here we go. Group A was has been led. These are the groups, by the way, before we go into it. Um, so, yeah, let's, how did it start? Well, let's go with how Group A went. We know the teams. That, actually, no, let me go back. Uh, group A was France, New Zealand, Guinea, and the United States. New Zealand played Guinea a couple uh, on match day one. In a match that was actually better than I thought it would be. But I'm surprised that the Ghanaians lost. I mean, the Ghanaians are pretty decent with the older the um, older national teams. Uh, they went out and lost to New Zealand. So the Kiwis are flying. As are France. They went out and beat the United States 3-0. They dominated the whole match. It was not close. These are the scores. Um, including a banger from Michael Elise. 
uh, as with Bad Day and Lacazette. Great match uh, for France. They look fl they're flying. They play Guinea next. So they're probably making the knockouts. It will be a battle between the United States and New Zealand. They play each other next. In Marseille, it's going to be fun. Group B, Iraq, Morocco, Argentina, Ukraine. We opened it up with Morocco and Argentina. Put me full screen for a minute. That insanity of Morocco, Argentina should would feed families if people understood what actual... I mean, let's go over the headlines. So, Morocco played Argentina. Morocco goes up 2-0. With just a, a little over half an hour to go. Argentina then scores. But due to like how much time wasting Morocco was doing. Allegedly. I didn't get to watch that part. 15 minutes of added time occurred. And in the back end of it. Argentina scores. But the Morocco fans are like throwing stuff on the pitch. So the game has to be stopped. Which was correctly done by the referees. But then VAR gets to look at it for, for eternity. For an eternity, they come back, they tell everyone to come back because the match isn't over yet, and they overturn the goal. The goal's disallowed, he was offside. So in one of the more miraculous results of the entire thing, Argentina, again, loses their opener in a major tournament, this time to Morocco, after losing in the World Cup 2022, just as a reference point. Losing to Saudi Arabia. They do it again. There was a penalty in the first, a goal in the first half, a penalty in the second. Argentina responds. They still did not win. Morocco comes out and wins in one of the most craziest matches I've ever seen. They come out and win. But then the Iraqis, led by Ayman Hussein, who's, I think this is the guy, who, there's another Hussein. I'm forgetting who this is. Yeah, he's the one on Al Khor. He's actually really good. Uh, he converted a penalty, but a late winner from Ali Jassim uh, steals the win for the Iraqis. And because of disciplinary points, the M Iraqis lead the Moroccans, then Argentina, and then Ukraine. I think Ukraine's going to have a lot of work to do. They play Morocco next, which actually could open the door for Argentina. Because I think they should, should beat Iraq, which does possibly put this situation... As all four teams on three points. But that's just a possibility. I like the chances for everyone still. Group C had the most boring game you've ever seen. Headlined by the Dominican Republic drawing Egypt. That game sucked. I am not talking about that game. Nil, nil, nothing happened. Spain played Uzbekistan. And I will tell you right now. Uzbekistan is flying even though they lost. They went out, conceded early, a poobal goal, put Spain up 1-0. They get a penalty. They score. They play great defensively. They conceded it again. But they played great. This game, I had a feeling, could have possibly been 5-1. But Uzbekistan played this game really well despite losing. I think they have the best chance to finish in second out of everyone. And partially because they play Egypt next. And if they beat Egypt, Dominican Republic's not beating Spain. If Uzbekistan wins, they played the Dominican last, which opens the door for Uzbekistan to make the knockouts. But if Egypt, if this game has a winner, whoever wins is going to the next round, possibly. But we'll see. Group D, we have Japan, Israel, Mali, and Paraguay. Japan is flying. They went out and won 5 0. Very respectable result for Japan. Paraguay's in shambles. They were probably the worst team here. Other than maybe Mali or the Dominican Republic. The real winners of day one are Israel. They went out. Yes, did they did not look good? Yes, they didn't look good. But Mali played a very Mali-like match. Conceded an own goal. But actually responded really well at the Parc de Princes. And went out and got a result. They get a draw. They play Japan next. Any form of points would be brilliant. If Israel loses, they're probably out. Because they have to play Japan last. But all of the groups are wide open. And that's exactly what you want to see in a tournament like this, where anything is truly possible. And that's why I really, really, really enjoy about this. We're going to stop sharing because I need to find the women's tournament for this. Uh, women's tournament. There we go. 
Um, women's tournament. We'll talk about that too because we talk about both sides, as as at least in the previews. I got to remember to do both sides in the recap. Women's soccer. Hello. Um, we had a couple of matches get played. Here are the draw. Who was the draw? Um, yeah, there's not a lot of teams. I believe it's 12 teams. Um, here are, hopefully they show the groups before. They, okay, so here are the groups. Uh, group A, France, Canada, Colombia, New Zealand. Uh, we opened it up with Canada, who are under a ton of controversy, by the way, beating New Zealand 2-1. to one. Cut me off again. Let's explain the Canada controversy. So, Canada, essentially, we'll, we'll put it shorten, spied on New Zealand prior to the match, and there's, like, some people are denying it. Hold on. Let me pull this up. We need to talk about this. So, it was a spying with a drone. Which I find fascinating, by the way. Let's go find this. All eyes on Canada's soccer at the Olympic as drone spying scandal develops. So this dude, Bev Priestman, I don't like him. Home, for, They sent him home. Uh, they're caught using a drone to film opponent's practice, which spurred a report saying that the both teams have been doing this for years, which led the, to the coach being sacked. And, by the way, they're the defending gold medalists of this thing. Um, but, yeah, it's apparently a mess. Um, the, the Olympic motto, yeah, this is a very biased article. We're going to find another one. That's an SI article. Wonder, uh, very interesting. Let's look at the CBS article. We love CBS. Uh, my apologies for that showing of bias. Because we need to have, we don't really show biased stuff on this channel. We try not to, at least. Here we go. Uh, the reigning gold medalist bottled it. Uh, they used a drone. This is the statement I was looking for. Over the past 24 hours, additional information has come to our attention regarding previous drone use against opponents, predating the Paris 2024 Olympics. In light of these new revelations, they made the decision to suspend the coach. He's not sacked, but he's suspended, a.k.a. probably sacked. Um... They're going to be led by this dude. Uh, and then the CBC, I don't know who that is. Uh, the director of the National Youth Program with Canada Soccer. Uh, is behind the whole thing, Joseph Lombardi. I don't like him. Uh, and I don't think many people will like him. But regardless of the fact, Canada is, is a mess. But they went out and won their opener. And I think that's the big thing that they're focusing on. They went out, won their opener, beat New Zealand, France... Puts up three goals in the first half. Almost bottles it to Colombia. Fair effort by Colombia. Remember, it's top, t like rugby, um, it's top two automatic. Third place has a chance to make it through. Colombia only losing by one goal. It could have been way worse for them. They're not in the worst spot ever. They do play New Zealand next. This has to be a win for either of them if they want any form of a chance. A draw helps no one. Group B is headlined by the United States and Germany. We opened it up with the United States playing Zambia. Um, even though the time's off. We'll talk about that game first. Um, Trinity Rodman uh, scores Swanson buried two within two minutes, which fair play. Uh, the United States walked Zambia as expected. And Germany, in the, in the real opening match, uh, went out and put three goals on Australia. And as expected by many, the United States and Germany... Are going he will have to go head to head to win the group in Marseille. It should be fun. Matches on Sunday. I will. I wish I could watch it, but I'm not going to be here, so I would not be able to watch the match. Uh, and then we have Australia, who has to play the United States to have any form of a chance. But it's going to come down to goal difference. And then Group C, we have Spain and Brazil. Rather predictably walked the group, though Brazil did not look very good against Nigeria. Spain did beat Japan on due to a late winner by Calden Caldente. I tried. I don't really know women's soccer very well, but Caldente scores the winner. They go on to beat Japan. Uh, Spain plays Nigeria next. Brazil plays Japan. I th listen. Anything's really possible, but I think Spain and uh, Brazil are going to walk the group. 
I'm really interested who on the third place teams are going to be. I think it's open for, like, Australia. I like the, how the Colombian. I did watch a little bit of the Colombia game. I think Colombia has a good chance, but we'll see. Uh, next, we're going to go to golf. We're only going to talk about men's golf because that's going to come first. and doesn't even start for, like, a week. So we'll just go through some of the names that we like to win the men's golf tournament next week. Golf at the Summer Olympics. Um, so essentially, you make it based on world ranking, uh, and like some nations, like it's the top players from your country. So we'll go sort by country first. Here are some of the players. Um, here are the nations rep. Actually, we'll scroll up. Here are the nations represented. Um, Argentina, Australia, Austria, Belgium, Canada, Chile, China, Colombia, Czechia. Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Great Britain, India, Ireland, Italy, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, Morocco, Netherlands, New Zealand, and Norway. Then Paraguay, Philippines, Poland, Puerto Rico, Singapore, Slovenia, South Africa, South Korea, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, Chinese Taipei, Thailand, and the United States. Because that's just how this works. Players to watch out for. So how I like the, to do this is usually play by the the golf course. For those who don't know where this is, we are playing at Le Golf Nacional, which is the host of our previous Ryder Cup. It's been on the DP World Tour schedule for like forever. And we're back yet again. So who is good at that Ryder Cup that's still here? There's I really don't know if there's many. I mean, Rory was on that team. Shane Lowry was on that team. Both resent representing Ireland. Uh, we have a pre pre recent winner of the French uh, tournament, the French Open, Open de France, uh, Guido Migliosi. I think he has a good chance of winning. Um, there's a good amount of gold, former gold medalist, former gold medalist and defending champion Xander Shoffley is here, defending Open champion as well. Xander Shoffley is here. Ludwig Auberg, I think, has a good shot. Alex Noren, recent winner of the French Open. I like how the, I like the Swedes. John Rahm's here. I don't know how he's going to be. Re people are going to re receive him because he's been playing on Live. I don't know how the Europeans feel about that, but we'll see. Uh, they did res respect a lot of the guys when they went to um, the Open, which is good, and I think it's a big positive for the game. South Africa, you can never count out the South Africans. Christian Besadenholt, DP World Tour star, he will be in the mix. As will Victor Hovland of Norway. I think he has a good shot of winning. Number six player in the world. Uh, was doing a little showcase in Oslo uh, this week before heading down to France. Uh, Gavin Green representing Malaysia. He's a decent player on the DP World Tour. Ryan Fox, popular pick by me. World number 59 now, which is actually insane for him. Scrolling up the list, we do have uh, former Ryder Cup star and I believe former France uh, Open the France winner. Uh, Tommy Fleetwood is here. Uh, Thorbjorn Olesen, Nikolai Hoygaard representing Denmark. The Danes are usually very good. Joaquin Neiman, very good from Chile. Corey Connors, very good from Canada, as is Nick Taylor. Thomas Dietrich, always competitive on the DP World Tour, as is Sepp Straka, who led... I have no idea what that is. There's like an alarm going off in the distance. Uh, but Sepp Straka has been in was in contention at the last Olympics. I think it's open to a lot of people. I personally would pick Tommy Fleetwood again, which he's not going to win now because I picked him. But I think him, Matt Fitzpatrick has been competitive here in the past. It's a very open field and a very interesting field because you have players who, I mean, you have the world number one, and you have players ranked at 366, because that's how rankings work. It's a very interesting tournament. It's a very open field, and it's very unpredictable. Remember, remember it's only 60 players, four-day event. I think a lot of people are going to be in contention. But the style, of course, links golf. I think favors players Alexander Shoffley, Tommy Fleetwood, who's, like I said, really bad at the open. Redemption time for Tommy Fleetwood. Um, defending open to France winners, I think are going to be great here. I, my personal favorite would be John Rahm for now. I'll probably talk about this on Tuesday, but I probably would say John Rahm. It's a very interesting course. He was really good at the Ryder Cup when it was here. He was a big name, big part of why they won. So 
I'll say John Rom wins the Olympic gold. Uh, silver, we'll go with Fleetwood. Bronze, Scheffler. That's my prediction for now. It might change in the next coming days. Who knows? Um, finally, uh, in terms of Olympics, we have tennis. Hell yeah, brother. We will start off with men's tennis. Uh, giant field, a lot of players. Let's take a look at it. Which big? I believe this begins tomorrow, so we'll do our predictions uh, right now. We're going to predict the whole thing. So we're doing this a little bit different. Uh, I mean, so here are the seeded players before we look at the whole draw. Here are the seeded players in this thing. Uh, 16 seeded players, as expected for this. We got Novak, Alcaraz, Zverev, Medvedev, Dimonor, Kasparud, Fritz, Stithibas, uh, Tommy Paul, Hugo, Ambert, Musetti, Baez, Argu, Aliasame, Felis, Tabilo, and Jari. Shout out to the Chileans who are balling in tennis right now, by the way. The, I, the nation I really did not expect to do anything yet. Um, I mean, they're a soccer nation, but they've been going doing really well in tennis. Here's the draws. Uh, section 1 will be probably headlined by Novak Djokovic. But watch out for Stefanos Tistipas and former uh, Wimbledon quarterfinalist Chris Eubanks. Remember, we are on... Uh, the clay is it clay? I don't know. I don't know what the really know what the surface is. Also, Rafa Nadal's here. Uh, shout out Rafa. Uh, I don't know what PR means, but here we are. Maybe he's here for the PR reps. But I know he's will be playing in doubles with Alcaraz, which is gonna be so much fun to watch. Uh, Rafa, I think beats Vujkovic, but then loses to Novak. So I think Novak will be in the third round. Personally, I I think Ronich and Koffer's match is gonna be pretty decent, but. I think it'll be 1-14. I think Felix will get past Arnaldi and probably Raonic. Uh, in the bottom part of the draw, I think Baez will face Eubanks with Baez beating Eubanks. Daniel Evans, I think, beats the Tunisian player. He'll face Tistipas. Daniel Evans over Tistipas. I think it will be a popular upset pick. Uh, but I do think Novak probably gets out of this. I don't think there's really another player in here, maybe other than Seb Baez. Who can really compete with him? Sissy possibly in that mix as well. Section two he is led by Zverev and Taylor Fritz. This draw I think is really interesting. There's a lot of top play or former top players here as well, including Stan Rebenka. Uh Zverev I think makes the third round. I don't think Zhang I think could cause problems, but Zverev's too good. Uh, Jari I think could lose to Rebenka, but whoever is going to play Zverev is going to get ran off the court. I like Lorenzo Musetti's odds. I th think he might get through. This will be a popular upset. Bublik over Taylor Fritz, I think, will be a very popular upset. Uh, ranked number seven in the tournament. Bublik is a horrible first-round matchup because I think Bublik will cause problems. He's been a very popular upset pick for me to go on and possibly be in contention for major tournaments. I think Musetti gets out of the bottom and then plays Zverev. I think Musetti might get out of Section 2. I think it's a very big possibility. Uh, section 3 is headlined by Kasparud and Daniel Medvedev. Uh, Francis Urgul Ayasame is actually going to get past the second round in something, but then we'll lose to Medvedev. I think he's going to walk Urgul Ayasame. Uh, in this draw, I like Severin Dolo. He's a player that I think a lot of people will know. I don't think that he would beat uh, Hugo Ambert. It will probably be rude and unbear at the top, and it's going to be all the seeded players on the bottom. There's really not a competitive bottom player that's not seeded that will be uh, in the mix, at least from my perspective. I think Medvedev comes out of this. I think Kasparud will cause problems, but Medvedev's just too good. I think he'll beat Rude. Uh, in Section 4, headlined by Alcaraz and Demonor. Now, as well as Tommy Paul, oh, I almost forgot about Tommy Paul. Tommy Paul, I think, will beat Demonor. So I think it'll be Paul against Alcaraz. Though Cam Nori can beat Alcaraz, by the way. I think Tommy Paul will make it out of this draw. Now, this is a very unpopular pick. I'll have Tommy Paul beat Darty, beat Mensik, and then beat Demonor. Because he is the only one here who can beat Alcaraz. He's beaten Alcaraz in the past. I, I like his odds. Alcaraz has to play uh, Habib from... He's American-born, but he's Lebanese. Fair play to him. Cameron Norton and Greek Spur is going to be an awesome match. I think both either of them can win. They both could get walked by Alcaraz, but still uh, it will be pretty fun. So my four uh, picks will be uh, Tommy Paul, Medvedev, Musetti, 
and Novak. I don't know how we get to there. So I think it'll probably be section one and section two, I would assume. Is that how this works? Yeah, top half. Um, so it would be... Oh, Jesus. Uh, so Novak's going to beat Musetti. And then... So it's a very possible final for Medvedev against Novak. I think Novak will take gold over Medvedev. And then the bronze... Um, it'll be Tommy Paul against, I'll, I'll take Lorenzo Musetti, uh, to win the bronze. I think that'll be a very fun men's tennis tournament. Uh, and on the women's side, we'll f try and find the women's singles draw. Uh, let's look at, at the, uh, let's look at the, uh, the seeds, the seeds first. Um, Eleanor Rybakino is supposed to be third, she just withdrew. Um, so there's now a 17th seed, and that's Caroline Garcia. Uh, Iga Zviatek, Coco Golf, Paulini, Pagula, Kian. Uh, I totally butchered that. Uh, I remember her being, uh, a known, we'll call her Zheng for this, because I think it's Keenvin. Keenan? Keenwin. We'll go Keenwin, sure. Sakari, Collins, Kretschkeva, Olstapenko, Navarro, Kujuk, Vekic, Hadad Maya, Schneider, Schneider? I don't know. Uh, Leo Fernandez and Carolina, Caroline Garcia. That's how we do this. Um, yeah, protected rankings, what PR means, by my, uh, my, so let's look at the first draw, which is already amazing off the job, off the top, uh, we do have an ITF player making the second round, which means, uh, the, there's an entry from the, from the, uh, organization, the sec, the first section is absolutely madness, so Via Texas can get out of the top, but the bottom is nuts, uh, led by, I think, Danielle Collins and Ostapenko, Caroline Wozniacki is going to play Danielle Collins. I think Collins gets some revenge from her pour out in at the at Wimbledon. I like Ostapenko to face. I think Zaviatek is going to walk this, even though there's a lot of seated players. I think Zaviatek will walk this. Section two. We have Caroline Garcia, who will be facing. I think Naomi Osaka upsets Caroline Garcia, so I have Osaka making the third round. She'll be playing against Leia Fernandez. And I think that match will be awesome. Osaka's, who's been decent, I believe, in the Olympics before, I think will make it to the quarterfinals before getting absolutely outed by Emma Navarro, who I've doubted in the past. I'm not doing that again. I think Emma Navarro will make this, the quarterfinals and then beat Naomi Osaka. So I have Emma Navarro in one semi in the semifinals against Iga Zaviatek. Oh, jeez. Uh, next one, we have Pagula is here. I like Kretschkeva to fit. Savitolina, I think, will upset Jess Pagula. Uh, Kretschkeva, I think, is going to walk her two matches to then face Savitolina. I want to pick Savitolina to win that. I'm not going to lie. Because she's been good in big matches. As has Kretschkeva. I'm going to the, go with the momentum and pick Kretschkeva. I know Savitolina has been a great player on on whatever surf. She's been good on all the surfaces, honestly, to me. But Kretschkeva, all the momentum in the world, I think she's going to win and go to the quarters. Uh, Paulini's walking the bottom. Uh, Haida Maya, I think, will lose to Kate Boltier. Uh, Paulini's going to face Kretschkeva, and I think Paulini... Um, no, we'll go with Kretschkeva to go to the semifinals. We'll pick Kretschkeva. Uh, this draw, I think it's just Coco Goffs to lose. There's not really anyone here. Maria Sicardi, Sicari, I think, is going to lose early on. I'm going to just say it straight. Coco Goffs making the semis, and I think she will beat... Uh, who do I have up here? Uh, Kreshkova. I think... So my final is going to be Coco Goff against Sicari. Not Sicari. Saviatek. Jesus Christ. Saviatek, Goff. So I think it'll be Saviatek, then Goff. And... Emma Navarro, bronze. That's what we'll do. That's my prediction. So let me just write that down. So, men's side, it was... We'll go back through the footage later, but... Let me just write this down again. So, just to reiterate... Gold, Sviatek. Silver, Goff. Bronze... Goes to Navarro. And we'll, I'll go through the men's side again later. 
I just have to... We'll talk about it next week. Okay. That's those are my predictions. Stop sharing the screen because we have some Formula One to talk about to end the show. And we'll go to Hungary. Now, Hungary, so many storylines. A incredible qualifying session. Now, was Paul Lando, Paul for Lando and Norris. A front row lockout for McLaren on a wet and dry and then wet and dry again qualifying session. But how did the race go? Well, they pitted. McLaren did this very interestingly. Uh, they pitted Lando first, but then they told him to give Oscar, Oscar Piastri took the lead in the turn one after Max uh, and the three big names got all well, got together. And this is how it ends. Piastri overtakes Lando on, la on the second to last lap to win the Hungarian Grand Prix. Now, I don't I disagree. And I still will disagree with the decision for this. Because if Piastri was leading and you thought Piastri was going to win, why didn't you pit Piastri first? It just doesn't make sense. For a team that's been this competitive all year, like, make it make sense. Lando has a chance to win the title. Give him the chance at least to win the title in this type of car. Because with the future regulation changes, you have no idea if you'll be back in the stage once those changes come into play in two years. I was not a fan of this at all. Also, shout out Hamilton getting his 200th podium. That was the big storyline for me other than the whatever McLaren was doing. Uh, Hamilton, Leclerc, Max is in fifth. We'll talk about Max in a minute. Carlos then Perez, who I think should have been driver of the day, along with Russell, Sonoda, and Stroll. Alonso, Ricardo, Hulkenberg, Albon, Magnussen, Baltas, Sargent, Ocon, Joe. Gasly got really unlucky because he did he DNF'd after, and saw something that wasn't his fault, which do be like that sometimes. Uh, but then we are now in Belgium, and because we're in Belgium, it's raining tomorrow, allegedly. So let's go through some of what has gone on during free practice. I watched the end of free practice today. It's a very interesting storyline. FP1, headlined by Max. By the way, this is the big headline. Max Verstappen has a 10-place grid penalty this week, so I am not picking him to win, though he would break the record for most uh, wins. You would like, because, how do I explain this? Every time you win in a different position on the grid, it gets, like, added up. So, like, Max is one from, like, nine or whatever it is. He's tied with Alonso. And if he starts from from like 13th or whatever, I don't know what the exact number number was they are talking about, he'll make history if he wins. He's not winning, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, Esteban, I believe, had car problems. Car problems with a lot of people today. Um, but that was the FP1 grid. And then FP2 was this group. Uh, headline for me by Lando Norris, who was flying as was Max. Leclerc, Sainz, Russell, Ocon, Magnussen, Perez, Hamilton, Stroll, Alonso, Botas, Ricardo, Gasly, Hulkenberg, Albon, Sargent, Show, and Sonoda. So, what is my projections before we talk about the last bit of news uh, with F1? Because there was some news recently that we'll co that was all confirmed. Poll one, two, three. Okay, so poll. I am going Piastri. Paul Piastri, then Leclerc looked good today. It's going to be about who can manage the wet really well, because it's a wet quality tomorrow. Hmm. I'm going to go then, I'm going to pull Piastri, second Lando, third Russell. And then my winner will be Norris. Then Rus then Russell and Piastri. That's what I'll do. Max fourth. Uh, that's my one, two, and three. Uh, finally, here are some news in F1. Esteban Alcon is a new is will be next year with Haas. He signed a, a deal very recently. He'll be partnering with Ali Behrman, which is like hilarious because hopefully Esteban doesn't want crash into his teammate just as much as he did with Pierre Gasly at Alpine. Uh, which say which means Kevin Magnuson for the second time will be leaving Haas. 
uh, in replacement for a younger driver, but that's just the way it is. Um, and then Mattia Bonotto, who we know was with Ferrari a couple of years ago, uh, very recently at least, uh, is going to be leading the project at Audi uh, when they come into F1 very soon. It'll be very interesting. Oh, maybe that links Carlos more with Audi. Who knows? Uh, but that's the recent F1 news that I have. And that is the end of today's episode of the Robbie Basil Show. MLB trade deadline. Other Olympic news. All of that coming to you next week. There will be an episode in the early stages of next week. Should go live on Tuesday, but we will see. But for now, I'm Robbie Basil saying so long. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye, everyone.